Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Thavedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. So in this context, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the enzyme nomenclature, classifications, and then uh, in the previous uh, module, we have also discussed about the enzyme structure. So we have discussed about the different types of methods to determine the primary structure, secondary structures, tertiary structure, and as well as the quaternary structures. And if you recall, in the previous module, we have discussed about how you can be able to produce the protein, uh, the enzyme in a very, very bulk quantities. And in this context, we have discussed about how you can be able to isolate the gene of interest, how you can be able to clone that gene of interest into the uh, vector of your interest, and then how you can be able to uh, utilize that uh, recombinant DNA to uh, overexpress the protein and purify the protein. And once you purify the protein, you can actually be able to utilize that enzyme for uh, you know, studying the different types of properties of the enzyme. You can actually be able to use the enzyme for catalyzing the different types of reactions or you can be able to use that enzyme for therapeutic applications. So in this context, in this particular module, we are discussing about the different types of enzyme, different types of reactions, what the enzyme can actually be able to catalyze to drive the uh, metabolic reactions. So in this context, uh, what we have discussed uh, in the previous two lectures, we have discussed about uh, catabolic reactions. So when we were discussing about the catabolic reactions, we catabolic reactions are the reactions which are actually producing the energy. And we have discussed about the, the catabolic uh, pathway of the two uh, biomolecules. We have discussed about the carbohydrate uh, metabolisms and we have also discussed about the lipid metabolisms. And both of these metabolisms are interrelated to each other in many ways so that the carbohydrate metabolism is uh, cross talking to the uh, lipid metabolism and vice versa. So both of these pathways are actually going to produce a large quantity of energy and this energy can be used for many applications. This energy can be used for the growth of the organisms. And when you want to grow, when you want to grow, you have to synthesize the new biomolecules. You have to synthesize the protein, right? Because you have to prepare the new, new, new cell, right? So you have to prepare the proteins. You have to prepare the lipids because you have to prepare the uh, plasma membrane, and then also you have to synthesize the nucleic acid. And all this synthesis part comes under the uh, reactions collectively called as the anabolic reactions. So anabolic reactions are the reaction which are actually being uh, covering the biosynthetic uh, pathways and uh, here we can actually be able to discuss. So in this particular lecture, we are discussing about the biosynthetic pathways uh, which is related to the amino acids. So here what we are discussing, we are discussing about the biosynthetic pathway of the amino acids and uh, so we have the different types of amino acids. So in this particular lecture, we are discussing about the biosynthesis of the amino acids. So biosynthesis of the amino acids are very, very important because when you synthesize the amino acids, you are actually going to utilize these amino acids to synthesize the protein. If you recall uh, in a in a prokaryotic system or in a eukaryotic system from the DNA, you are actually going to produce the RNA and from the RNA, the RNA transcripts are actually going to be read by the ribosomes, right? And the ribosome, when it actually going to read the genetic code, it is actually going to utilize the amino acids corresponding to those uh, uh, genetic code and that's how they are actually going to uh, use the different types of amino, amino, amino acids and these amino acids are going to be coupled uh, with the help of the peptide bond. So with the help of the peptide bond, the two amino acids are actually going to be coupled and that's how it is actually going to give you ultimately the proteins, right? And the protein synthesis is actually or the enzyme synthesis is very, very important 
for the meta, uh, running the metabolic reactions and also it is important for the growth of the cell. Because the proteins are the integral part of the plasma membrane, proteins are the integral part of the cytosol and proteins are also playing a crucial role in catalyzing the different types of reactions. Now, as far as the amino acid biosynthesis is concerned, the amino acid can be categorized into the two categories. One is called as the essential amino acids and the other is called as the non-essential amino acids, right? So, you know that we have the 20 amino acids, 20 uh, naturally occurring amino acids, right? You can actually have the more than 20 amino acids uh, in the non-naturally non -naturally occurring amino acid, but you have the 20 amino acids as a naturally occurring amino acids and all these 20 naturally occurring amino acids can be categorized into the two uh, category. One is called as the essential amino acid, the other is called as a non-essential amino acid. So, uh, essential amino acids are like isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, valine, arginine and histidine. What is essential amino acids? Essential amino acids are the amino acids which cannot be synthesized in human body, right, or animal body. So, they are actually going to be synthesized in plant and from the plant you can actually be able to receive uh, into the human and that is why these are called as essential amino acids because we do not have the uh, amino acid uh, synthesis pathways uh, for these amino acids. Whereas non-essential amino acids are the amino acids which for which the synthesis pathway is available. So, synthesis pathway is, uh, is, is present in uh, in human, right? Or they can be derived from the other uh, metabolic intermediates, okay? So, we can have the couple of examples from this so that you will understand how the other metabolic intermediate could be able to use or could be able to utilize for the uh, synthesis of the amino acids. So, principally, all amino acids are derived from the either glycolysis or the citric acid cycle or the pentose phosphate pathway intermediates. These derivatives provide the carbon skeleton for the amino acid whereas the amino group or the nitrogen from the same is provided by the glutamine or the glutamate. Not all the amino acids are synthesized by the organism which they need from the outer environment either in the form of protein or from the dietary food. These amino acids which cannot be synthesized by the organism itself are called as essential amino acid, the rest other non-essential amino acids. The most important reaction that takes place in almost all the biosynthetic pathway of different amino acids are reductive aminations of the alpha keto acid, the reaction which is leading to the formation of glutamate and transamination reaction which is going to be performed by the enzyme which is called as amino transferase requires a coenzyme PLP, PLP is pyridoxal phosphate and pyridoxal phosphate is a vitamin, okay. And that is why sometimes uh, you might be deficient in the vitamin and that is why you cannot be able to synthesize some of these crucial amino acids. Now, as far as the uh, amino acid synthesis is concerned, uh, amino acids can be synthesized either from the glycolysis or the TCA cycle or the pentose phosphate pathway. So, if you see an overview of the amino acid biosynthesis, what you will see is that the glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, so this is actually a, uh, what you see from here to here, that is actually the glycolysis, right? And uh, so, for in the first step itself, the glucose is getting converted into glucose 6-phosphate, right? Where if you recall, we can actually be able to use the hexokinase. And the glucose uh, also can be can get converted into the ribulose 5-phosphate and the ribulose 5-phosphate can be then uh, derived or can provide the biosynthesis of the histidine. Uh, similarly, uh, the glucose 6-phosphate uh, with the help of different reactions can be converted into the 3-phosphoglycerate and the 3-phosphoglycerate can be channelized into the two different pathways. One is called arthrose 4-phosphate 
and the other one is called as a 3 glucose 3 phosphoglycerate can be uh, be as a cursor for the uh, serine biosynthesis and once you have the serine biosynthesis uh, serine can also give rise to the glycine and as well as the cysteine uh, 3 phosphoglycerate can be converted into phosphoenol pyruvate and if you combine the arthrose 4 phosphate and the phosphoenol pyruvate that can be serve as a precursor for the some of the aromatic amino acids such as tryptophan, uh, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. Uh, then the phosphoenol pyruvate is getting converted into the 3 phosphoglycerate and the 3 phosphoglycerate is getting converted into the pyruvate right and the pyruvate is entering into the TCA cycle right so it is forming the citrate so pyruvate is a precursor for some of these uh, amino acids like the alanine valine leucine and isoleucine similarly from the citric acid cycle uh, you can have the amino acids like from the alpha ketoglutarate you can be able to have the precursor for the uh, glutamate and from the glutamate you can be able to synthesize the glutamine proline and arginine uh, on the other hand the oxaloacetate can be uh, you know be a precursor for the synthesis of the aspartate and aspartate can be a precursor for the arginine methionine asparagine uh, methionine uh, threonine and lysine so this is just an overview to show that the importance of the carbohydrate metabolism in providing the different types of amino acids you can see that from the each intermediates or almost all the intermediates are getting involved in the providing the precursor for the synthesis of some of the amino acids now based on these amino acids can, uh, can be derived can be classified into the different families so you can have the uh, glutamate families so from the glutamate families uh, you can have the synthesis of the glutamate glutamine arginine and proline similarly from the pyruvate families uh, the you can actually have the synthesis of valine alanine leucine and isoleucine from the aspartate you can actually have seen that uh, from the tca cycle you can be able to synthesize the aspartate and from the aspartate you can have the aspartate arginine asparagine methionine threonine and lysine similarly from the serine you can have the synthesis of serine cysteine and glycine and uh, from the aromatic amino acids you can have the uh, tryptophan phenylalanine and tyrosine and from the histidine you can have the synthesis of the histidine so these are the some of the uh, families amino acid families based on the biosynthesis so you can have the glutamate you can have the pyruvate, you can have the aspartate, you can have the serine, you can have the aromatic amino acids and you can also have the histidine. Now let's see how you can be able to have the biosynthesis of some of the amino acids. So we'll start with the glutamate. So biosynthesis of the glutamate and the glutamate derivatives such as glutamine. So alpha ketoglutarate, so you will you will get the alpha ketoglutarate from the TCA cycle, right? Uh, and once you prepare the alpha glutarate, it is actually going to be get converted into the glutamate by the help of the uh, reactions which are going to be catalyzed. And uh, the glutamate is then uh, going to be get converted into glutamine, proline and arginine. So uh, how you can have the biosynthesis of all of these amino acids? So you can have the uh, biosynthesis of the glutamate and glutamine. So the glutamate is actually going to be synthesized from the alpha ketoglutarate, right? And uh, from the alpha ketoglutarate, then the glutamine synthesis is an important mechanism of ammonium acylations, transportation in different cells and excretion thereafter. Free ammonium ion is toxic for the cell, which is converted into glutamine for the transportations in bacteria and the plant glutamate is derived from the glutamine of catalase cat glutamine uh, catalyzed by an enzyme which is called as GOGAT like the glutamine oxaloglutarate amino transferase here glutamine acts as a nitrogen donor and the alpha glutoglutarate undergoes reductive deaminations so the action what is going to catalyze is alpha glutoglutarate plus glutamine gives the 
glutamate plus NAD plus and you will see that it is actually going to be uh, you know use the reducing equivalent and as well as the energy in terms of ATP. So, this is what it is going to form right from the glutamate you are going to have the uh, uh, these these reactions and that's how it is actually going to synthesize the uh, from the glutamine to glutamate. Animals don't have the glutamate synthase, therefore uh, they maintain the high level of glutamate by the transamination of the alpha glutoglutaride while the while amino acid catabolism. Glutamate can also be formed by the glutamate dehydrogenase in a single step reaction in below. The reaction takes place in the mitochondria. The enzyme cannot distinguish between NADH and NADPH. So, alpha glutoglutarate from with ammonia and NADPH will give you the glutamate and NAD+. So, what you see here is that the uh, from the glutamate, it is actually going to first get the uh, you know the consumption of one amount of ATP, and as a result, it is actually going to form the gamma glutamyl phosphate. Uh, the enzyme what is going to catalyze this reaction is called as glutamine synthesis and then from the glutamine synthesis is again going to catalyze another round of reaction where it is actually going to take the ammonia from the uh, uh, from the cell right and it is actually going to assimilate that ammonia to synthesize the L-glutamine and uh, and L-glutamine is actually going to be you know if it is if, if there is a requirement of production of L-glutamate the L-glutamine is actually going to be, uh, you know, get cleaved. Uh, the ammonia is going to be cleaved by the enzyme which is called as glutaminase and that is how the ammonia is going to be released and this ammonia is going to be a toxic byproduct. As I said, you know, ammonia is very toxic. So, this ammonia is going to be assimilate in the form of urea and the urea is actually going to excrete out from the body. This anyway we are going to discuss in detail later on. And by, by doing so, the glutamine is going to be get converted into the glutamate. Then the second uh, pathway is the biosynthesis of the serine, glycine and the cysteine. So, free phosphoglycerate, the free phosphoglycerate is going to be synthesized during the uh, glycolysis and that is actually going to give you the serine and that serine is going to be a precursor for the two enzyme, uh, two amino acids, one is called as the glycine and the cysteine, right. So, how we are going to have the biosynthesis of serine, glycine and cysteine? Serine is derived from the oxidation of 3-phosphoglycerate by an enzyme which is called as uh, phosphoglycerate dehydrogenase in the presence of NAD plus to produce the 3-phosphohydroxypyruvate. Uh, so, this is what 3-phosphoglycerate, it is actually going to be get the uh, reduction and as a result of this, uh, the it is actually going to form the 3 phosphohydroxypyruvate and the enzyme what is going to catalyze this reaction is called as phosphoglycerate dehydrogenase and one molecule of NAD plus is going to be get converted into NADH which means it is actually going to produce some amount of energy. So, instead of consuming the energy, it is actually going to you know produce the energy. And then in the second step, the glutamine transfer its amino group to the above synthesized product to yield the 3 phosphoserine followed by the hydrolysis of phosphate group by the enzyme phosphoserine phosphatase to yield the serine. So, in the second step, since you do not have the in ammonia into this molecule, the glutamate is uh, going to uh, contribute the into the ammonia, right? So, glutamate is going to get converted into alpha glutarate and uh, it is actually going to transfer the ammonia to the molecule and as a result, it is actually going to form the 3 phosphoserine and this reaction is going to be catalyzed by an enzyme which is called as phosphoserine amino transferase. And once it, the phosphoserine is going to be formed, then there will be a dephosphorylation reactions which is going to be catalyzed by the phosphoserine phosphatase and then as a result, it is actually going to synthesize the glycine and uh, as a result, it is going to synthesize the serine. Once the serine is formed, it is actually going to be act by the enzyme which is called as serine hydroxymethyltransferase or SHMT and uh, by the help of this, uh, the serine is going to be get converted into the glycine. The 
the prof the tetrahydrofolate is going to be get converted into N5 and 10 methylene tetrahydrofolate and the serine hydroxymethyl transferase the SHMT is always utilizing the PLP or the pyridoxal phosphate as a cofactor uh, for catalyzing these reactions. Uh, so the pathway for the serine and glycine are almost the same except for the synthesis of glycine after the removal of carbon atom from the serine by an enzyme which is called as serine hydroxymethyl transferase. In the above reaction, the beta carbon of the serine is accepted by the tetrahydrofolate in the presence of PLP. In plants and bacteria, cysteine is derived from the serine and for which the sulfur is obtained from the environmental sulfates. Firstly, an acetyl group is attached to the serine from the acetyl CoA to form the O acetyl serine. This reaction is performed by the enzyme which is called as serine acetyl transferase. The reduced sulfur is then incorporated into the above product by an enzyme which is called as O acetyl serine lyase to yield the cysteine. In mammals, the process is quite different. The carbon skeleton and the sulfur for serine biosynthesis is given by the two different amino acids, that is the serine and the methionine respectively. So in the cysteine synthesis is different in the plant versus the animals. Then we have the another biosynthesis of the aspartate family amino acids. So from the oxaloacetate, you are going to have the transamination reaction and that is going to synthesize the aspartate and from the aspartate uh, it is actually going to give you the asparagine if there will be uh, am amidations then it is actually going to form the asparagine whereas from the aspartate you can be able to synthesize the amino acids threonine uh, and uh, lysine so from the aspartate you can be able to synthesize the methionine threonine and the lysine then we have the biosynthesis of the pyruvate family amino acids. So from the pyruvate, you can actually have the transamination that is going to give you the alanine. Uh, from the pyruvate, you can actually have the as a precursor for the valine, isoleucine, and as well as the leucine biosynthesis. Uh, so let's see how you can actually have the biosynthesis of the aspartate family groups. So the carbon skeleton for the aspartate and aniline is derived from the oxaloacetate and the pyruvate itself respectively, whereas the amino group is provided by the glutamine for both the amino acids. In the above reactions, the alpha glutaglutarate is formed as by a byproduct along with the alanine and aspartate as the amino acid. This is an example of the transamination reaction and it is catalyzed by the amino transferases in the presence of the coenzyme that is the PLP. So pyridoxal 5-phosphate or the aldehyde containing co coenzymes. So what you have is you are actually going to have the oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate you are going to get from the uh, TCA cycle, right? And this oxaloacetate is going to react with the glutamate and then there will be a transamination reaction. So this amino group is actually going to be transferred onto the oxaloacetate and as a result it is actually going to form the aspartate. Uh, on the other hand, the glutamate is going to get converted into the alpha glutoglutarate and this type of reactions are called as the transaminations and these and reactions are going to be catalyzed by the enzyme which is called as the transaminases or the amino transaminases. Uh, okay, so in this reaction, what it is happening is that it is actually you know uh, taking the amino group from the one enzyme and uh, one amino acid and it is converting uh, putting it onto the second molecule. So there is a transfer of amino groups from the one molecule to another molecule, and that's how it is actually going to synthesize the one amino acid. These reactions are reversible, so you can actually have, if there will be a, a aspartate and alpha butyrate, it is actually going to run in this direction and it is actually going to synthesize the oxaloacetate and glutamate. And that is how the TCA cycle is can very easily be able to communicate with the uh, amino acid uh, biosynthesis. Right? So, you can imagine that if there will be a deficiency of amino acid, the TCA cycle will pull the intermediates towards the amino acid biosynthesis and the reaction will run in this direction and that is how you are going to have the synthesis of aspartate. But if there will be excess of aspartate, then the reactions are going to run in this direction 
and that's how it is actually going to run the TCA cycle as a faster rate. And uh, you are going to have the very high quantity of synthesis of oxaloacetate and uh, that oxaloacetate will enter into the Krebs cycle for energy production. And as a byproduct, it is also going to synthesize the glutamate and that glutamate is actually going to use for the protein synthesis. Similarly, the similar kind of transamination reaction can also occur with the pyruvate. So, in, the, in this case, you have the pyruvate and the glutamate and you can have the amino group which is going to be transferred onto the pyruvate and it is actually going to synthesize the alanine and the alpha glutoglutarate. This reaction is also going to be catalyzed by the transaminases and uh, this also has the same, card, same kind of significance. When you have the shortage of the sugar, right, there will be this reaction is going to run in this direction or if there will be a shortage of glutamate, it is going to run in this direction. But if there is a requirement of alanine, then it is going to run in this direction. So, this is actually, these are the reactions which are actually going to connect the carbohydrate metabolism as well as the protein metabolism and that is how they are actually going to uh, keep a fine balance on the, uh, you know, on the biosynthetic pathway and as well as the catabolic pathways. Then we have the biosynthesis of proline and arginine. So, Proline is a, is a cyclic, cyclized derivative of glutamate which is synthesized in a series of enzyme derived reactions shown in the pathway. Right? This is the pathway for the proline synthesis. In this pathway, a key intermediate glutamate gamma semi aldehyde is formed which undergoes rapid cyclization process followed by the reduction by an enzyme which is called as pyroline carboxylate reductase to finally yield the proline. In mammals, the proline can only be formed from the arginine. Here the arginine play a crucial role in the conversion of the arginine to ornithine which is converted to, to the gamma semi aldehyde by an enzyme ornithine alpha amino uh, transferase which then follow the same pathway as described above. In animals, the arginine is produced. So, this is what you have the synthesis of the uh, proline, right? So, from the glutamate, you have the phosphorylations by the enzyme which is called as glutamate kinase, and it is actually going to synthesize, going to form the gamma glutamyl phosphatase, a uh, phosphate, gamma glutamyl phosphate, and the gamma glutamyl phosphate is going to be oxidized uh, to uh, by the enzyme uh, by the called as gamma glutamyl phosphor phosphate reductase. So, it is actually going to be reduced. And that is how it is actually going to form the glutamate semi aldehyde. And glutamate, as soon as the gamma, uh, glutamate semi aldehyde is going to be formed, it is actually going to uh, get cyclized to give you the pyroline 5 carboxylate. And pyroline 5 carboxylate is going to be uh, go for the another round of reduction by the enzyme, which is called as pyroline carboxylate reductase and as a result it is actually going to form the proline and uh, whereas in the case of in animals the arginine is produced from the glutamate in urea cycle principally arginine is derived of is a derivative of the ornithine which can also be produced from the glutamate gamma semi aldehyde by the transamination reaction, but the cyclization of gamma semi aldehyde inducted the enough supply of the same to synthesize the ornithine. In the case of bacteria, there is a de novo pathway altogether for the formation of ornithine and therefore uh, arginine also. So, these are the another pathway of the um, aromatic amino acids. So, in the aromatic amino acids, you can actually be able to use the phosphoenol pyruvate which is going to be formed from the glycolysis and uh, the arthrose phosphorphate which is from the uh, pentose phosphate pathway. And when they come together, they are going to serve as a precursor for all the uh, tip aromatic amino acids such as tyrosine, tryptophan, uh, phenylalanine and the tyrosine. So, tryptophan what is going to be formed can be converted into tyrosine. The branch pathway is main route for the formation of aromatic amino acid in the plant, bacteria and fungi in which the phosphoenol pyruvate and the arthrosphore phosphate react to form the shikimate which is converted into the chorismate 
and that acts as a branch point for the formation of three amino acid that is the tryptophan, phenylalanine and tyrosine. In tryptophan synthesis, the curismate is converted into anthraanylate where the glutamine donates, donates its nitrogen atom that becomes a part of the indole ring. The indole ring of the tryptophan is derived from the anthraanylate and the other two carbon from the PRPP which is phosphoenyl pyruvate. So, in the first step you are going to have the synthesis of the corismate with the by the interaction of the phosphoenyl pyruvate and uh, electrosis for phosphate which is going to form the shikimate and then shikimate is going to be converted into the uh, corismate. So, once the corismate is going to be formed, it is actually going to get the amino group from the glutamine and the enzyme what is going to catalyze and, and it is going to get converted into the glutamate and the enzyme what is going to synthesize this reaction is called as the anthraanylate synthase and as a result it is actually going to form the anthraanylate right. So, from the corismate you are synthesizing the anthraanylate and from the anthraanylate it is actually going to get the uh, pyrophorus phosphate. So, anthraanylate phosphoribosyl transferase is going to catalyze the, con the addition of the, these ribose sugars and uh, that is how it is actually going to form the 5-phosphoribosyl uh, anthraanylate and then anthraanylate is getting converted into the indole 3-glycerol phosphate synthase. Uh, with the help of this, it is actually going to form the enol 3 carboxyphenyl amino deoxyribulose phosphate and that get converted into indole 3 phosphodiserate and that is going to get uh, the conversion of this into the tryptophan with the help of the enzyme which is called as tryptophan synthase and the serine is actually going to be get converted into glycerol di 3 phosphate and that is how you are going to have the synthesis of tryptophan. From the tryptophan the enzyme synthase which form the last reaction in the conversion as two subunit right and the two part of the whole reaction. So, indole 3 glycerol dehy indole 3 uh, glycerol phosphate is going to first get converted into indole first and the glycerol di 3 phosphate and the indole is going to react with serine and it is actually going to form the tryptophan. Uh, so, indole formed in the first part of the reaction is moved through the channel from the alpha subunit the beta subunit activate where it undergoes condensation uh, with ship base intermediates and results in the reaction between the PLP and serine. In animals, the tyrosine can be formed by the hydroxylation phenylalanine at the C4 position by the enzyme which is called as a phenylalanine hydroxylase. So, the tyrosine what is going to be formed when it is going to get the hydroxylation it is going to form the phenylalanine and the enzyme what is going to catalyze is called as the phenylalanine hydroxylase. Then we have the biosynthesis of the phenylalanine and tyrosine in the plants and bacteria. So, in the plants and bacteria phenylalanine and tyrosine is derived from the corismate whereas Prefinate is the common intermediate and then pathway diverges to the two branch one forming the tyrosine and uh, from the 4 hydroxy pyruvate and the other is forming the phenylalanine from the phenyl pyruvate. So, this is what you have first you have synthesized the corismate right. So, corismate is going to be synthesized you might have this we, you might have seen how the corismate is formed when we were discussed when we the uh, the phosphoenyl pyruvate and the ritosis 4 phosphate is reacting with each other and forming the corismate and the corismate is actually getting converted into the prefinate by the enzyme which is called as corismate mutase and the prefinate is getting diverged into the two pathway. One is uh, you know giving rise to the synthesis of the tyrosine, the other is going to give rise to the synthesis of phenylalanine. So, uh, in the first step of the uh, Tyrosine synthesis, the prefinate is getting uh, you know oxidized to, uh, to give rise to the 4 hydroxy phenyl pyruvate and the enzyme what it catalyzes this reaction is called as prefinate dehydrogenase. And then for 4 hydroxy uh, phenyl pyruvate, there will be a uh, amino transferase reaction and that is how the glutamate is getting converted into alpha cryptoglutarate. And that is how the 4 hydroxy phenyl pyruvate is getting converted into the tyrosine. 
Similarly, in, in the second pathway, so this is the first pathway, the second pathway, uh, you, the prefinate can also uh, form the uh, phenyl pyruvate with the help of the enzyme which is called as prefinate dehydrogenase and there will be a decarboxylation reactions and uh, then this actually going to get the amino transferase and that's how it is actually going to form the alpha glutarate and it's going to form the phenylalanine and you might have seen that the tyrosine also can get converted into the phenylalanine with the help of the enzyme which is called as the phenyl hydroxylase so uh, the final reaction of transamylation involves the transfer of amino group from the glutamine then we have how we can actually have the regulation of the amino acid biosynthesis, right? So from the glutamate, you can have the synthesis of glutamine. Uh, the enzyme what it catalyzes this reaction is called as glutamine synthetase. And uh, there are many amino acids which are actually going to block this activity. So amino acid biosynthesis is allosterically regulated. The end product of the pathway generally regulate the enzyme that catalyzes the initial step of the pathway. Along with the allosteric modulations, feedback inhibition is also seen that regulates the amino acid biosynthesis. Glutamine synthetase is an important enzyme that participates in almost all the biosynthesis pathway reaction. Therefore, this enzyme is inhibited by various other molecules such as AMP, CTP, glycine, alanine. The overall effect of all the inhibitor is that the more additive and it is hence is known as the concerted inhibitions. So, since the glutamate can also be, you know, form the glutamine and then from the glutamate you can also have the synthesis of many other molecules like the glycine and the cysteine and all that, glycine is actually going to, you know, inhibit this activity of glutamine synthetase, uh, alanine is also going to inhibit this activity. So, other mechanisms seen are sequential feedback mechanism which are more profound in the aromatic amino acid biosynthetic pathway. In this mechanism, the amino acids phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan sequentially inhibit the 3 isozyme of the enzyme which is called as DHP or 2 keto 3 deoxy d arabino uh, heptosulinate 7 pathway. pathway. So this is all about the uh, the catabolic reactions, what we have discussed and the anabolic reactions. But whether you catalyze the catabolic reactions where you are going to convert the glucose into the carbon dioxide plus water, right? And that's how you are actually going to produce some energy or whether you are going to run the anabolic reactions so that the some of these glucose derivatives are going to be get converted into amino acids and in this pathway also there will be a production of ammonia so whether you are um, forming the carbon you know forming the carbon dioxide or whether you are releasing the ammonia into the reactions both of these uh, you know intermediates or both of these uh, molecules are uh, you know uh, toxic to the cell and that's how you can actually be able to have the pathway so that you can actually combine these two and form the one of the very very less toxic byproduct and that is called as the urea so urea is actually going to be a natural uh, non uh, relatively less toxic byproduct which can be synthesized with the help of the ammonia and the carbon dioxide to form the and that actually is going to be uh, you know release out in the excretra. So how the uh, urea excretion or the nitrogen excretion is going to take place. So nitrogen excretion and the urea cycle. So the urea cycle is made up of a four step. The formation of citrulline from the ornithine and carbamyl phosphate. Citrulline enters the cytosol. Then we have the arginosuccinate formation via citrulline AMP intermediates and the arginine formation from the um, arginosuccinate. This reaction produces the fumarate which enters the citrate high cycle and the urea formation this reaction also regenerates the ornithine. Interconnection of urea cycle and the citrate cycle. The urea cycle results in the net conversion of oxaloacetate to fumarate, both of which are intermediate in the citrate cycle. The two cycles are then interconnected. 
the linked cycles have been dubbed the Krebs bicycle. The aspartate arginosuccinate shunt refers to the pathway that connects the citric acid cycle and the urea cycle. These effectively connect the fates of the amino groups and the amino acid carbon skeleton. Some citric acid enzymes such as fumarates and the malate dehydrogenase have the isozymes that are found in both the cytosol and the mitochondria. If the urea cycle, the purine biosynthesis or other activities produce fumarates in the cytosol, it can be ch changed into the cytosolic malate which is then utilized in the cytosol or transferred into the mitochondria through the malate aspartate shuttle shuttle to start the citric acid cycle. So this is what it is actually. So you have the glutamine and from the glutamine you are going to have the production of glutamate and ammonia. Then from the ammonia can be shuttled between the different amino acids with the help of the, uh, the amino acid uh, transaminases and all that. And as a result uh, you are going to have the synthesis of the ornithine and ornithine is getting converted into citrulline and citrulline is getting converted into the arginosuccinate and then arginosuccinate is reproducing the ornithine and with the help of that it is actually going to form the urea. So uh, it is actually going to take up the, uh, the nitrogen toxic products from the mitochondria. So in, these are the reactions what are going to catalyze in the mitochondria and these are the reactions what are going to synthesize in the cytosol and ultimately it is actually going to produce a urea and urea is a water soluble product. So it is actually going to be solubilized in water and that is how it is actually going to be excreted out in the phase of urine. So the urea cycle, the urea cycles activity is controlled at two levels, enzyme synthesis and the allosteric regulation of the enzyme that catalyzes the formation of carbamoyl phosphate. Four high energy phosphate groups are required to produce one urea molecule. To generate the carbamoyl phosphate, two ATP molecules are needed, but only one ATP is needed to make the arginosuccinate, which is made by the pyrophosphate cleavage of the latter ATP into AMP and PPI, which is hydrolyzed to give the 2PI. So the urea cycle, the regeneration of the oxaloacetate in the malate dehydrogenase reaction results in NADH and the urea cycle also need to be the net conversion of oxaloacetate to fumarate. During the mitochondrial reaction and respiration, each NADH molecule can produce up to significantly lowering the overall reactions. So you can have the two molecules of ammonia, you can have the bicarbonates, you can have the ATP and that is how it is actually going to form the urea with two ATPs and AMPs and water. So the net reaction of the urea cycle is that you are going to consume a large quantity of energy like the three ATPs and it is actually going to fix the ammonia and as well as the carbon dioxide from the byproducts and that is how it is actually going to form the urea and urea is going to be excreted out from the body by the urine. Okay? So uh, this is all about the catabolic and anabolic reactions where the enzymes are playing very crucial role. So what we have discussed, we have discussed about the catabolic reactions which are responsible for energy productions and in that context we have discussed about the carbohydrate metabolisms and as well as the lipid metabolisms and within the carbohydrate metabolism we have discussed about the, uh, we have discussed about the uh, the glycolysis and as well as the Krebs cycle and we have uh, you know discussed how the Krebs glycolysis and Krebs cycles are important for the energy production and how these uh, inter how these uh, you know uh, pathways are connected to the other pathways for the uh, for making a fine balance so that you can be able to control the uh, different intermediates from the different um, pathways and that's how the Krebs cycle is called as the central pathway. And then uh, we have also discussed about the lipid oxidation. So we have discussed about the beta oxidation, different steps in the beta oxidations and how the beta oxidation is producing the large quantity of energy because every beta oxidation cycle is producing the one molecule of acetyl CoA and that one molecule of acetyl CoA is entering into the Krebs cycle and that is how it is also running the, uh, you know, the, it is also producing the large quantity of energy through the utilization of the Krebs cycle. 
and at the end uh, we have uh, also discussed about the anabolic pathways so anabolic pathways are responsible for the biosynthesis of the different types of biomolecules such as the uh, lipid molecules the protein molecules and as well as the uh, the amino acids and uh, in this particular context we have discussed about the biosynthesis of the different types of amino acids so we discussed about the essential amino acid and as well as the non essential amino acids and uh, what we understood from the biosynthetic pathway is that the biosynthetic pathway utilizes the energy what is being produced during the catabolism to run the uh, this condensation reactions and all other kinds of reactions to synthesize the new molecules and what we have also seen that the anabolic reaction and as well as the catabolic reactions are communicating with each other through the some of the crucial intermediates and uh, enzymes play a very crucial role in all of these pathways and as well as the crucial steps and that's how you might have seen that the many of the uh, reaction intermediates are allosterically or feedback mechanism uh, way is uh, modulating the activity of these enzyme and that's how it are controlling the uh, reaction intermediates so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss some more interesting aspects related to enzyme thank you